Welcome to the Tourette Association of American National Conference. Thank you for joining us for Understanding Oppositional Behaviors. We want to thank our platinum sponsors today, the Warner Fund and Pharma, as well as all of our donors and supporters for making this free conference possible. To support educational programming like this, you may visit Tourette.org backslash donate to make a contribution. My name is Wendy Wegman, and I am the Education Specialist here at the Tourette Association of America. During this session, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time. Please use the question panel and not the chat option. We will collect your questions and address them during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Ross Green. Dr. Green is a New York Times bestselling author, author of the influential books, The Explosive Child, Lost at School, Lost and Found, and Raising Human Beings. He's the originator of the model of care described in those books, now called Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. Dr. Green was on the faculty at Harvard Medical School for over 20 years and is now founding director of the nonprofit Lives in the Balance, which provides a vast array of free web-based resources on the CPS model. He's appeared in a wide range of media, including The Oprah Show, Good Morning America, The Morning Show, National Public Radio, Mother Jones Magazine, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Chicago Tribune, and The Boston Globe. Dr. Green lectures and consults widely throughout the world and lives in Portland, Maine. Am I on? You are on. Thank you, Dr. Green. Hi again, everybody. Um, I am going to operate on the assumption that all of you were in the first presentation and that I can jump right in to understanding oppositional behavior. I am also going to leave a ton of time for questions because I did not take any questions in the presentation that I did just before. Um, I want to leave lots of time for questions now. So mostly I want to put a little bit of flesh on the bone for plan A, plan B, and plan C. So as you know from the first presentation, uh, and let me do a little bit of review here. Um, in this model, we rely very heavily on the research that's accumulated over the last 40 to 50 years telling us that kids and other human beings who are responding poorly to life's problems and frustrations are lacking very important skills and not lacking motivation. What skills are they lacking? Those of you who were in my presentation just now know that there are many, many dozens of them, but that you will come face to face with 18 of them on the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. So it's not only crucial to identify what skills they're lacking, so we get the right lenses on, lagging skills, not lagging motivation. It is even more important to identify the expectations they're having difficulty meeting their unsolved problems, because those unsolved problems are going to be the major, major focal point of our efforts to help them. Now, let there be no doubt, getting more accurate, compassionate, productive lenses on about your kid is huge, and that's what the lagging skills are for. Um, but if all you have is more accurate, compassionate, productive lenses, then you won't know what problems you could be busy solving to try to significantly reduce the concerning behaviors that are being caused by those unsolved problems. So identifying unsolved problems is crucial as well. And as I'm thinking most of you know, um, you're gonna identify those lagging skills and unsolved problems using an instrument that you can find on the Lives in the Balance website known as the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. So there is your three minute review of what I covered in my previous presentation, just for those of you who weren't in that presentation. Now we can move forward. Wow, 
I could have done that presentation in three minutes. Probably not as well. Now we can think about how we want to solve those problems. And as I described in the previous presentation, you have three options, but you're only going to be using two of them uh, in this model. Plan A, Plan B, and Plan C were my way of making life more simple. Uh, these really are pretty much the basic ways in which caregivers respond to unsolved problems in kids. Unfortunately, Plan A is still way too popular. It's where the caregiver is solving the problem unilaterally, it's where the caregiver is assuming, I already know what's making it hard for the kid to meet this expectation, and therefore, I am the one who is uniquely qualified to come up with the solution. Wrong model. That's not this model. Why is this not this model? Why is that not this model? Because um, we adults are frequently wrong about what we think is making it hard for a kid to meet a particular expectation. And if we're wrong about that, then the solution we come up with based on our incorrect prep, uh, incorrect idea, the word I'm looking for starts with a P, but I can't remember what that word is right now. Uh, our incorrect ideas about what's making it hard for the kid to meet the expectation, those solutions aren't going to work very well. And in fact, if we impose those solutions on kids who are lacking the skills to handle demands for flexibility, adaptability, frustration, tolerance, problem solving, and emotion regulation, we're going to cause concerning behaviors. Um, so in this model, we're not going to do that unless you find yourself in an emergent, unpredictable situation involving safety. I'm still trying to think of the P word. I'm betting one of you can think of the P word that I was looking for. I'll think of it before the end. It's bugging me now. Um, so we're going to be relying in this model on plan B as the way we're going to be solving problems with kids. You're doing that collaboratively through three steps that I described in the previous hour, but we'll describe again with more detail. Um, plan B is where you're solving the problem collaboratively with the kid as your partner. Presuppositions. Presuppositions is the P word. Um, Plan C, which I hurried past in my prior presentation, that's where you're setting the problem aside, at least for now. But I don't want to hurry past it this time. I want to talk about Plan C a little bit before we start talking a lot more about Plan B. And yes, I'm going to be showing you a video as well as telling you some stories if we have time uh, during this hour. We're going to be a little bit more laid back this hour. Plan C, crucial in this model. Why is it crucial? It's crucial for a few reasons. Number one, a lot of kids, when we finally get around to identifying all of the expectations they're having difficulty meeting, using the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems, there are a lot of them. Sometimes, and this would not be unusual, so don't freak out if your kid has 30, 40, 50 different expectations that your kid is having difficulty meeting reliably. Don't be surprised. Um, number one, you can't work on them all at once. And one of the biggest reasons that those unsolved problems are still unsolved is because often caregivers do try to work on them all at once, usually in the heat of the moment when they pop up again. Not good strategy when you're trying to solve a problem. The other reason that the problems are not unsolved is because we weren't focused on the problems in the first place. We were focused on the behaviors that are being caused by those problems. And if all we're focused on is the behavior, the problems don't get solved. And those are most of the reasons the problems don't get solved. There they are, right there. But you can't work on them all at once now that you've identified them. So some of them you have to prioritize away, at least for now. And I'll talk about how you do that in a second. Uh, but well, actually, we already did talk about it. If it involves safety, you're probably not going to prioritize it away. That's high priority. That you're going to try to get solved with plan B. 
But there's another reason that you might decide that you want to plan C, a particular expectation. And that is that you don't even think your kid can meet that expectation right now. So if your kid has 50 different unsolved problems, what I often see happen is that causes adults to take note, to, to take a step back and say, goodness, look at all the expectations that are getting put on this kid. Number one, how much do we care about all of these expectations? 50 that he can't meet? Goodness, 50 that he can't meet. Uh, if I had 50 expectations that I had difficulty meeting and I knew that they were all going to get thrown at me over the course of a day, I think I might not get out of bed in the morning if that's what was waiting for me. So sometimes the process of using the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems helps adults take the 10,000 foot view and say, holy cow, look at what we're expecting from this kid every day. And a lot of these expectations, we're not even sure the kid can actually meet. Um, when I'm trying to help educators and staff and facilities get rid of restraint and seclusion, one of my favorite mottos is, I hate seeing kids get restrained and secluded over expectations we already know the kid cannot reliably meet. If we got rid of the expectations we already know the kid cannot reliably meet, we'd get rid of the lion's share of restraint and seclusion in our schools and in our treatment facilities. So plan C is very important for that reason too. But officially, the main function of plan C is to prioritize because you can't work on everything at once. Um, how do you prioritize, how do you get rid of an expectation for now? Oh, by the way, Many adults are very uncomfortable with the idea of getting rid of an expectation. After all, it's our job to come up with expectations. Well, it's, yeah, it's your job to come up with expectations. It's also your job to get rid of expectations. You know your kid can't meet, and it's also your job to prioritize if a kid cannot reliably meet an expectation, and there are many, many of those. That's your job, too. Let me help you feel better about plan C. The, the kid isn't reliably meeting the expectation anyways. The kid isn't reliably meeting the expectation anyway. So now you got two choices. You could keep putting the expectation on the kid that you don't think the kid can reliably meet, cause concerning behaviors, make everybody's life miserable, or make it official. Uh, you don't have to meet that expectation right now. Uh, it's gone for now. Will it come back? Maybe, uh, either at the point where we think that you are able to meet it or at the point that it becomes a higher priority. That's when they come back. So what does plan C look like? Well, one form of plan C is to just not bring it up. So let's say you have put brushing teeth before going to bed at night into plan C. Um, what would that sound like when it's time for the kids, at the time that you usually announce that it's time for kids to brush their teeth? It would sound like this. That was it. You just don't bring it up. There's another form of plan C it's where you're coming up with an interim plan for setting aside a particular problem, at least for now. You're not solving it. You're just collaborating with your kid on a plan for what it's gonna look like while the unsolved problem is removed for now. Let's say you've decided that homework completion is in plan C. You're not solving the homework problem, that would be plan B but you are collaborating with your kid on what it's gonna look like during homework time when they're not doing their homework, but also so they're not bugging their siblings who are doing homework. Or in a classroom, uh, you've set aside a particular task or assignment right now, but you and the kid are collaborating on an interim plan 
for what the kid is going to be doing while the rest of the class is working on that assignment so that the kid isn't bugging classmates or so that the kid isn't embarrassed that the rest of the class is working on something and they're not. There's a variety of forms of Plan C. Um, those are among the most common. As you already heard, if you were in my last presentation, Plan B consists of three steps, the empathy step, the define it all concern step, and the invitation step. As you've already heard, the empathy step is where you're gathering information from the kid about what's making it hard to meet a particular expectation. Um, the empathy step begins with an introduction. The introduction begins with the words, I've noticed that, and ends with the words, what's up? In between, you are inserting an unsolved problem that you wanted to be talking with your kid about. Here's what it might sound like. I've noticed you've been having difficulty brushing your teeth before going to bed at night. What's up? Um, after you say what's up, one of five things is going to happen next. Possible number one, kid's going to say something. Possible number two, kid's going to say nothing or I don't know. Possibly number three, the kid is going to say, uh, I don't have a problem with that, or I don't care. Possibly number four, the kid's going to say something like, I don't want to talk about it right now. And possibly number five, the kid's going to get defensive and say something like, I don't have to talk to you, or worse. We don't have time for me to tell you what to do about all five, but we do have time for me to tell you what to do about the first two. Let's say the kid says something after you say, what's up? Here's the deal. Whatever the kid says first is not going to give you the clearest possible understanding of what's making it hard for the kid to meet a particular expectation. So you're going to have to probe for more information, a process I call drilling, drilling for information. And um, drilling for information, I always say, is the hardest part of doing all of Plan B. It's where most ships run aground. It's where most captains abandon ship, mostly because us captains didn't know what to say. That's why on the Lives in the Balance website, you want to find in the same place that you're going to find the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems, you want to find the drilling cheat sheet. On the drilling cheat sheet are eight drilling strategies. I'm only going to talk about one of them. You can learn about the other seven by checking out the drilling cheat sheet. The one I want to talk about is the most important drilling strategy, the one you're going to be using most often, the one you're going to use when you don't know what strategy to use. It's your default drilling strategy. It's called reflective listening, also known as mirroring. Now, some of you may already know about this. Um, it's where you're saying back to the kid whatever the kid just said to you. You could do an entire empathy step with just that one drilling strategy. Here's what it would sound like. I've noticed you've been having difficulty completing the double digit division problems on the worksheet in math. That was a good unsolved problem. What's up? I hate it. Now, a lot of people have no idea what to say in response to things like I hate it. They think that's a showstopper. It's not a showstopper. If you've got reflective listening in your back pocket, you hate it. Um, you're then going to add a clarifying question or statement like, um, uh, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand what you mean. What, what, what do you hate? It's stupid. Uh-oh, another showstopper. Not another showstopper. You've got reflective listening in your back pocket. Don't forget, you've got reflective listening in your back pocket. It's stupid clarifying question or statement. Um, I'm confused. I don't know what you mean by that it's stupid. It's stupid how you give us math we don't know how to do. Hmm. Are we starting to get some high quality information here? We are. And all we did was reflective listening twice. Um, that's your default drilling strategy. There are no showstoppers. 
when you've got reflective listening in your back pocket. But there are seven other drilling strategies on the drilling cheat sheet. It's there waiting for you on the Lives in the Balance website. Um, what else did I want to tell you? Oh, I want to give you an example of the empathy step. And then I'll give you another example. We're probably not going to have time for me to show you a video, but there's a ton of video on the Lives in the Balance website. So I'm not feeling too badly about that. What I feel most strongly about is giving you time to ask questions. Um, here's what an empathy step sounded like. I was doing a podcast with a father who does podcasts maybe about a year and a half or two ago, and he was telling me about his three-year-old daughter who was having difficulty brushing her teeth before going to bed at night. And he was telling me the story. He was telling me he didn't do the empathy step. He thought he already knew was what was making it hard for her to brush her teeth before going to bed at night. He thought, he was sure, it was the taste of the toothpaste. So he's telling me the story. He said, eight to 10 flavors of toothpaste later, who knew there were that many flavors, she was still having difficulty brushing her teeth before going to bed at night. So finally, he said, he did the empathy step. I've noticed you've been having difficulty brushing your teeth before going to bed at night. What's up? She said, when you brush my teeth with the electric toothbrush, before I go to bed at night, it gets water all over my face and I hate it. I said to him, now there's a concern eight to 10 different flavors of toothpaste could never conceivably address. That's the empathy step. Now, you might be wondering before I move on, what about the non-talkers? What about the reluctant talkers? What about the non-speakers? Lots of strategies there. Um, Here's your biggest strategy with the reluctant talkers. As I've already, as I said in the previous presentation, stop trying to talk with them about their concerning behavior and try talking with them instead about what's making it hard for them to meet a particular expectation. And don't do it in the heat of the moment, do it proactively. Then we'll see if your reluctant talker is still a reluctant talker. Those are two big ones and you really haven't done anything yet. You've just changed the subject and you've changed the timing. But what, what if you still have a reluctant talker? There are many, many strategies, but here's one of my favorites. I teach the kid five fingers. Five means very true. Four means pretty true. Three means sorta true. Two means not very true. One means not true at all. Uh, then you can make statements, your theories. Now your theories might come in handy, by the way. Uh, about what's making it hard for the kid to meet a particular expectation. And all the kid's got to do is hold up fingers to let you know how true your statement is. I know, really simple. I cannot tell you how much information I get out of reluctant talkers that way through five fingers. And by the way, if five fingers is too much for the kid, I'll go with three. If three is too many, I'll go with two. If fingers are not the kid's gig, I'll go with sticky pads and write yes and no on two sticky pads, and all the kid's got to do is tap yes or no to let me know how true my statement is. And by the way, the lines have just blurred between the kids who aren't talking but can and those who aren't talking because they can't, they're non-speakers. But the vast majority of non-speakers these days have assistive technologies, pro low quota go, apps that are free, uh, pictures that are free. There's a lot of ways to communicate with kids who are non-speaking, um, but it can be as basic as yes and no, or true and false. Or if you wanted to add a third option, and I don't love to add options, I like to keep things simple. You could go with an I don't know option, and then you are still making statements, and you are, the kid is communicating with you, not through the spoken word, but communicating with you nonetheless. By the way, I use pictures with kids who are verbal, so the, the lines blur for me. The way of approaching kids who are using words versus those who aren't, as you can now tell, are not that 
different. By the way, my reference point for all of this is infants who have no words, but who do communicate that they're struggling, red face, vomiting, crying nonstop. What do we do with infants who are communicating with us that they are having difficulty, but who cannot tell us what the difficulty is, as we would with nonverbal kids, with non-speaking kids, either through fingers or assistive technology or pictures, we're guessing. And then we are applying a solution that we hope will work. And then we are completely dependent on the infant to let us know how we did. Um, and this is how you collaborate even with an infant. Here's what's interesting. A, a lot of people are delighted to collaborate with an infant. But the minute the kid turns two years old, they become consumed with a different concept. They're no longer trying to be responsive to their infant. They are trying to get their toddler to be compliant. Somehow that happens at around the age of two. Um, and of course, there's something happening on the other end too. This toddler, who as an infant really didn't have a lot of ways to do what they wanted, now have locomotion and language to do what they want. And that clashes with the new adult obsession with compliance. And that goes a long way toward explaining why they called that period of life the terrible twos, just no longer sure about who they're saying it's terrible for. Maybe everybody, you can never go wrong being responsive to the hand you've been dealt. The problem is not that we try to do that with infants. The problem is that we stop. All right, I think I've said enough about the empathy step. The define it all concern step is where the adult, as you've already heard, are entering their concern into consideration on the same unsolved problem. As I said earlier, we adults have very important concerns as well. Uh, we usually try to get them addressed through use of plan A, but when we are trying to get them addressed in plan B, the biggest hurdle we run into is the fact that we don't know what our concern is. That's because we've probably been so focused on solutions all along. Um, so let me help you out with that. What are you probably concerned about? Uh, why it's important that that expectation be met? And why is it important that that expectation be met? Because of how it's affecting the kid, health, safety, learning, and or how it's affecting other people, health, safety, learning. I don't think you're going to have that much trouble with the define it all concern step, because now you know it's either related to how it's affecting the kid or how the unsolved problem is affecting other people. Both are related to health, safety, and learning. The define it all concern step should be the fastest and easiest of the three steps. What was the father's concern in the dentist, uh, in the difficulty brushing teeth before going to bed at night unsolved problem? He said, my concern is that you don't brush your teeth before you go to bed at night. Uh, the food that you've been eating all day, the bacteria from that food is going to sit on your teeth all night, and that can cause cavities. And here's how it's affecting the kid. Uh, it hurts to get cavities filled. And here's how it's affecting others. And it doesn't have to be both, by the way. That's going to cost me money that I don't really feel like I want to spend. There are now two sets of concerns on the table. No turning back now. You're ready for the invitation. The invitation begins with the words, I wonder if there's a way. Generically, what do you wonder if there's a way to do? You wonder if there's a way to solve this problem. But And you could say it that way. But if you say it that way, a lot of kids will look at you and say, what problem? So what you want to do instead is recap or restate the concerns of both parties. Here's what it might sound like on the teeth brushing issue. I wonder if there's a way for us to make sure that we don't get water all over your face when I'm brushing your teeth before you go to bed at night. 
and also make sure that the bacteria doesn't sit on your teeth all night, which could cause cavities, which could hurt a lot to get filled and which would cost me money I don't really wanna spend. You are then giving the kid the first crack at the solution. You got any ideas? Um, they usually do, but if they don't, I'm sure you do, but they usually do. And this three-year-old, a lot of people don't think you can even do plan B with a three-year-old, but this three-year-old did. She said, maybe we could wrap a towel around my face when you're brushing my teeth with the electric toothbrush so that we don't get water all over my face and so that the bacteria doesn't sit on my teeth all night. By the way, the two criteria for a good solution are that it has to be realistic, meaning both parties got to do what they're agreeing to do, got to be able to do what they're agreeing to do. And even more important than that, they've got to be mutually satisfactory, meaning the solution truly addresses the concerns of both parties. It sounds like that one would. But you're checking in with the kid about whether the solution is going to work for them and whether they can do it. And you're doing a self-check on whether you can do the solution and whether it addresses your concern. Here's what I've been saying a lot lately, and world history bears me out on it. If the solution is not realistic and mutually satisfactory, I promise you, this problem is still unsolved. Which explains why here in the United States, we are still dealing with problems that have been unsolved for two, three, four hundred years. All right, we are going to turn our attention to questions in five minutes. I've just given you the basics of how you do each of the three steps. More details on the Lives in the Balance website, but I want to tell you one more story about what Plan B looks like. This is my favorite story ever, and therefore, you should hear it. Um, as part of my usual first meeting with parents and their kids, for example, in a clinical setting, I usually spend the first half hour or so with the parents or caregivers. The kid is out in the waiting room. Um, what am I doing in that first half hour? I'm trying to identify the kid's lagging skills and unsolved problems. Now, I fully appreciate the fact that what parents often want to tell me about when they're first meeting with me is about their kids' concerning behaviors. And we'll do that for two or three minutes. But since now you know, I don't rank behaviors, and I'm much more interested in the conditions in which those behaviors occur when the kid is having difficulty meeting certain expectations, and I'm much more interested in making sure that we are sharing a shared set of lenses, lagging skills, I'm going to spend most of that first half hour trying to help adults identify a kid's lagging skills and unsolved problems. Uh, not that I'm unempathic about the behaviors, I do feel people's pain. I just want to make sure I'm doing them some good in that half an hour, and I'm not going to do them any good if all we're doing is talking about the kids' concerning behaviors. Um, on this particular day, very long time ago, I was meeting with the single mom of a little four-year-old girl. In the first half hour, I met with the mom. The little four-year-old girl was out in the waiting room. Sounded horrible. Horrible what was going on at home. Literally dozens of meltdowns every week. Um, over the course of that half an hour, it quickly became apparent that this mother had been blessed with a daughter who was a very concrete, literal, rigid, inflexible thinker. I sometimes refer to those kids as black and white thinkers living in a gray world. And listening to the mother, it also started to become clear that the apple had not fallen very far from the tree. After about a half an hour, out goes the mum, in comes the kid. In, as usual, walks cute little kid. As part of my initial conversations with these kids, I like to ask them if they can think of anything that caused a big blowout between them and their parent or parents or grandparents or caregivers in the last week. I said to this little four-year-old girl, uh, can you think of anything that caused a big blowout between you and your mom in the last week? 
She said, yes. First thing I noticed, very serious kid. A lot of these black and white thinkers take life very seriously. I said, what caused a big blowout between you and your mom in the last week? She said, my mom poked a hole in my chicken pot pie. Now I gotta tell you something about me. I've worked with way too many of these kids at this point. There's really only two things that turn me on about them anymore, seeing them get better and novelty. And back then I had never heard of a kid losing her mind over having a hole poked in her chicken pot pie. I'm thinking, tell me more. Uh, I mean, if I hear one more story about a kid losing their mind over homework, I'm going to lose my mind. I said, um, by the way, I've never heard of this before, so I thought I had just stumbled upon the disorder that was going to make me famous. I was going to name it after myself, write it up in all the journals. But about three months later, I was telling this very same story in Charlotte, North Carolina. And a mom in my audience started laughing hysterically. I said, what's so funny? She said, I hate having holes poked in my chicken pot pie too. I said, you do? What's the problem? She said the exact same thing the kid said, which I haven't told you yet. All right, here we go, back with the kid. Um, I discovered, this is not that unusual. Some of you hate having holes poked in your chicken pot pie. I said to the little girl, what's the, uh, your mom poked a hole in your chicken pot pie. Why'd she do that? She said she wanted to make sure the insides weren't too hot for me to eat. I'm thinking that's reasonable. See, adults have important concerns, but we've skipped a step. And actually, normally the mother would be in with us. I just want to see if this kid could do anything resembling plan B. I said to her, uh, what's the problem with having a hole poked in your chicken pot pie? She got dead serious. She said the exact same thing the woman in Charlotte, North Carolina said. If you poke a hole in the chicken pot pie, the crust gets wet, and the crust is supposed to be crusty. I had never heard of this before, but now I want to see if the kid can do anything similar to the invitation. I said, uh, you want the crust to be crusty. Your mom wants to make sure your mouth doesn't get burned on the insides. I wonder if there's a way for us to make sure the crust stays crusty and also make sure your mouth doesn't get burned on the insides. You got any ideas? Um, now, by the way, I'm gonna tell you what she said in a second, but although this is a true story, it's also emblematic of how I would go about trying to solve any problem with a kid. And if I work with adults, it would be with adults too. I work with adults who are parents, of course, and teachers. But if they were the ones with the unsolved problems, this is how I would go about solving them. This is how I work with kids and their caregivers on unsafe sex, school truancy, substance use. Same three steps. Um, I said to the girl, you got any ideas? She did. She said, my mom could get a spatula. She could get the crust of the pot pie off the top. She could lay it on the side. I could eat the crust first. And then by the time I was through eating the crust, the insides would have cooled down enough so my mom wouldn't have to stick her finger in my food. I'm thinking, the mother has got to hear this. I jumped out of my seat, ran out to the waiting room. The mother sees I've got a big smile on my face. She thinks I've uncovered some deep-rooted psychological issue in just five minutes. She comes racing after me back to my office, sits down filled with anticipation and says, what y'all been talking about? I said, pot pies. Her face turned gray. I said, uh, she said, uh, we haven't had pot pies since then. I said, I think you might be very interested to hear the solution your daughter has come up with to the the pot pie problem. I said, go ahead, tell her. Kid told her. The mom's jaw dropped wide open, literally. Uh, why'd the mother's jaw drop wide open? She never knew her kid could do this. Why didn't she know her kid could do this? Because she'd been too busy trying to solve everything with plan A. What's the moral of the story? 
if you're trying to solve everything with plan A, you're going to slam the door on plan B, and you're going to cause a whole lot of conflict. Besides, plan B is where the conversation takes place, communication occurs, relationships improve, kids have voice, caregivers have voice, kids have agency, caregivers have agency, problems get solved, and the concerning behaviors that are being caused by those problems subside. All right, enough stories. Let's start to take some questions. I hope there are questions, otherwise we're ending earlier, but I bet there are. Any questions? Hi, Dr. Green. There's a lot of questions. Thank you so much for this excellent presentation and your keynote address as well. So we're now going to be begin answering the questions, but as a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the question panel um, in your control panel or the question pane in your control panel. If we're unable to get to all the questions submitted, we'll be following up after the session with a response. Additionally, here at TA, we have full-time trained in information and referral staff available to assist you by emailing support at Tourette.org or calling 1-888-4-Tourette. So our first question for you, Dr. Green, is do you think this process can always work in public school in general ed? Do I think this process can always work in public school in general ed? Uh, we do this in public schools all the time, so I don't think that's going to be the issue. If the question is, can this always be done in general ed? Well, we do this with kids in special ed, too. You know, for me, I'm interpreting that question to mean, um, is general ed always going to be the best place for a kid? And my answer is going to be an interesting one. I'd like to see how many kids would stay in general ed if we were doing this process instead of processes that are a whole lot more oriented toward focusing on concerning behavior and traditional discipline. I think we would cut the number of kids in special ed dramatically, but I can tell you that we've done this in many, many general ed settings We've done this in entire school systems, um, and we've done this in special ed settings as well. I don't see a massive difference between doing this in general versus special ed. Um, there's my answer. Thank you, Dr. Green. As a follow-up from that, do you support behavior classrooms slash alternative placements until a kid has more of these skills? We are. Uh, there is definitely, there are definitely kids who, because of how we currently do things in general ed, are blowing out of general ed. Will we ever get rid of special ed completely? I don't know. I'd be interested to find that out. To get there, we'd have to be doing what I just described as much in general ed as we do in special ed. Um, do I believe in I don't, I don't like calling them behavior classrooms. Do I believe that there are going to be some kids who need a um, better staff to student ratio until we can get our act together when it comes to what this kid needs in general ed? Right now, it seems to me that we are stuck with it, but I don't know if that is an indictment of general ed and the fact that these kids can't be in general ed. For me, it is more an indictment of how we handle still here in the year 2021 concerning behaviors and understand concerning behaviors in general ed. Thank you, Dr. Green. Have you seen this model work with kids whose behaviors are driven in part by psychosis? Um, there aren't that many kids whose behavior is driven by psychosis and kids who are psychotic are probably going to need medicine to help them become less psychotic. Um, I'm trying to think of kids who we've done this with who were psychotic. What's coming to mind at the moment in more recent memory are adults who we've done this with. We've, we've implemented this model until COVID hit uh, in the uh, Maine State Hospital called Riverview up here in Maine where I live. 
um, with psychotic adults. And it was my first experience with psychotic adults. I didn't know if this was going to fly with psychotic adults. Um, boy, did it fly with psychotic adults. Um, they were, of course, medicated, so their psychosis probably wasn't as bad as it would have been before they were medicated. Um, I'm having trouble remembering kids with psychosis who we've done this with. They are so rare. The one who's coming to mind, people said the kid was psychotic, and I concluded that the kid was not psychotic. So um, I don't think he counts. None are coming to mind at the moment, but I can't imagine why we wouldn't try to solve problems collaboratively with a kid who is actively psychotic. Me, I'd want to see if we could help the kid be less actively psychotic, probably through medicine, probably in advance of trying to solve problems collaboratively. Thank you. So here is a question about 11-year-old with oppositional defiant disorder, general anxiety disorder, and Tourette syndrome. How can we set limits on physical aggression and threats to family and property unlucky behavior while not focusing on the behavior in the moment family feels threatened and bullied well um as you've been hearing me say you're going to need to complete the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems so that the kid is very predictable and so that as much as possible you don't find yourself stuck in the heat of the moment with aggressive behaviors feeling threatened. Now, I completely empathize with your situation, but this is the situation a lot of the families that I work with find themselves in, and this is what I do. The assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems have to come first. We've got to make this kid predictable. Then we've got to prioritize. We've got to put some, if not many, unsolved problems into plan C. Uh, unsolved problems that are in plan C are expectations we have removed for now. They aren't going to set in motion concerning behaviors, and we aren't going to have family members feeling threatened by those concerning behaviors because the concerning behaviors are gone because the expectation is gone, at least for now. So uh, what's being described here for me is more, I, I'd move quickly into stability mode, but stability mode doesn't um, change things all that much. I'm still prioritizing. I'm still putting a lot of unsolved problems in plan C, not only because we have to prioritize, but also because we have to stabilize. As a clinician, not knowing this child or this situation well at all, I would be asking myself, um, would medication help with stability here as well? Medication is frequently not my primary consideration, but when it comes to stability, Sometimes it is a more important consideration than others. And then we'd start trying to solve those problems with the kid, the ones that remain, collaboratively and proactively. That is how I help families get out of the heat of the moment, by dramatically reducing expectations for now and then adding them back slowly, by solving high priority unsolved problems. Those unsolved problems, by the way, once they're not unsolved anymore, aren't going to set in motion concerning behaviors. Um, notice, I really didn't comment at all on the diagnoses that the kid has. As you can tell, they don't really tell me all that much. I'm still gonna pretty, do, pretty much do the exact same thing. Thank you. Next question, for unknown reasons to me, my daughter doesn't like yellow lights. Should we replace all light bulbs? Um, I might do plan B on that first to see if there's a collaborative solution that's possible. The key piece of information in there is for reasons unknown. Um, so long as the reasons are unknown, you don't have great options. You can either keep the, if the reasons are still unknown, you either keep the yellow lights and say to yourself, well, she'll have to suck it up, or you're saying we got to get rid of all the other yellow lights because we don't know what's making the yellow lights hard for her, so we'll just get rid of them. Um, I'd like to add a third option to that, plan B. If you can get information from your daughter about what's hard about the yellow lights, um, and if she can be engaged in coming up with a solution that works for both of you and is realistic, 
you may be able to save some money on different colored lights. Okay, thank you, Dr. Green. Um, this one, hello, Dr. Green. I have twin 14-year-old boys who both have Tourette and the accompanying comorbidities. The worst moments are now between the two boys. One's shushing sound, tick triggers the other's rage. This goes on endlessly and is now to the point where they don't want to be together. Even watching a TV show together is stressful for the boys. Any thoughts on this? Yes, maybe not being together is not a bad idea. Um, but I would try plan B first. Um, maybe they can be engaged. And it sounds like we do have some information about what is setting each other off. Um, and certainly reducing time together could be a solution that they're both good with, um, especially since it sounds like they are requesting that they not be together. Now, um, on the surface of that, I don't have a problem with that as a solution. There are parents who I've worked with who had a problem with that as a solution because they felt very strongly about family togetherness. But family togetherness that is god awful uh, is um, not as good as family not togetherness that is tolerable and actually pleasant. But I'd rather have the two boys come to that solution through a collaborative process rather than as an act of desperation or because we haven't really thought about other potential solutions yet. What do I think of that though? It might be a fine solution, especially if everybody involved is good with it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Green. How do I get my 16-year-old son back to the table to try plan B when he has been plan A most of his life? He is convinced we will not listen to his input even if offered? Um, I hear that a lot. You may need a mental health professional who knows this model to do some blocking for you. Maybe your son will feel that the mental health professional will listen and then the health, mental health professional can help prove to your son that you will listen too. So that's a role I sometimes play for some families. But I also sometimes hear that and sometimes simply by saying to the kid, and maybe you've said this already, um, listen, we um, appreciate the fact that we've been going about doing things in a way that had the primary effect of causing you not to talk to us. And we regret that. And we appreciate why you wouldn't trust us in saying what I'm about to say now but we very badly do want to hear what you have to say, and we are not going to impose anything on you. Um, this is not about punishing you. This is not about rewarding you either. This is not about making sure you hear us instead of us hearing you. So we'd like to be able, we'd like to try to prove that to you um, if you would give us one more chance. There's kids who will do that, um, and there's kids who won't do that, in which case you may need a mental health professional to do some of that blocking for you. But um, if you haven't tried that approach, I might try that approach. Okay, thank you. How do you explain to other siblings that expectations are lowered only for the child with concerning behaviors? Other kids think it's not fair when expectations are different. Well, um, the good news is that there isn't a household that I'm aware of where fair means equal, nor a classroom, I should add. Uh, in every household, um, somebody's getting something somebody else isn't getting. So here's what's interesting. The norm is that we have different expectations for different kids based on what they are and aren't able to do. That is the norm. Um, now, kids who are observant are going to notice when expectations are different for different people in the family, but that doesn't mean we should respond to those very good questions by trying to have the exact same expectations for everybody. That doesn't exist in school classrooms. That doesn't exist in homes, no. Everybody's different, 
everybody has different skills. Um, when you need help in our family, we give you help. When you have a skill that you can help somebody else with, we help you use that skill. If there's something you're really good at and your sibling is not really good at it, why on earth would we treat you both exactly the same? That would be the surefire way to make sure that neither of you got what you needed from us. No, the norm is everybody in this family is different. Everybody needs different things. Everybody has different skills. Everybody has different expectations and that works for everybody. Great, thank you. I have a student who is, oops, let's see my question just looped up here. Sorry about that. Let's see if I can get it back here. Oh, I have a student who is doing a good job with plan B, but still has very rigid thinking in some areas, particularly perceived injustices. For example, when in the collaboration step, step, he may state, my plan is to get revenge no matter what. And at times we will not budge for a more, or at times he will not budge for a more reasonable plan. What would you suggest? Um, not knowing the kid, it might be hard, a little bit hard for me to be super specific. My initial thought is that um, I would hope that the kid would start becoming more flexible through lots of plan B. Um, but this sounds like a kid who may need us to do something perhaps outside of plan B to further explore, and maybe you've done this, um, the advantages of getting revenge, how that solves problems. Um, so there may be need for a sidebar discussion with the kid to explore further where that thinking is coming from and how the kid thinks that getting revenge would work um, and what it would accomplish if we played it out. Um, that's probably what I would do if I didn't feel that just more repetitions of plan B would help the kid become more flexible about potential solutions. Thank you, Dr. Green. I have a 13 year old boy who has difficulty with communication. We've gone through the first two steps but during invitation, he has no idea on a solution. I've tried giving, giving him my own solutions, but he says, I don't know. Any further advice? Yes. Um, you can depict solutions in pictures, but the other thing is this, the universe of solutions fall into three categories, I think. I, I haven't thought about this lately, but this is, when I've been working with kids who had a similar scenario, what I tried to do is make solutions more concrete, the, the universe of solutions more concrete. My best sense is that the universe of solutions fall into these three categories. Ask for help, give a little, do it a different way. Ask for help, give a little, do it a different way. Sometimes kids who are having trouble thinking of solutions need us to make the universe of solutions more concrete. So at least we can get into a category, ask for help, do it a different way, uh, give a little. Sometimes if they can help us with a category, then we can think of different solutions that might fit within that category, which might make it easier for kids to think of them and for them to agree on ones that we might come up with in that category. Without knowing more about the kid than what we've just described, it's hard for me to be more specific than that. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, here's another question. I have been... make this the last one because um, we've got people waiting for me. Absolutely, thank you. <clears throat> I have been reading about PDA, pathological demand avoidance, and how this relates to my daughter's challenging behaviors. What are your thoughts on this designation? My designation on pathological demand avoidance is I feel no differently about pathological demand avoidance than I do about any other diagnosis. We still have to figure out your child's lagging skills and unsolved problems. 
But if you spent the next three days thinking about your child having pathological demand avoidance, I think you'll find that three days later, nothing has changed and you still have to figure out what are my kids lagging skills? What are my kids unsolved problems? Now you may find support groups for pathological demand avoidance online and that might help you feel less alone. That would not be a bad thing. But when it comes to really understanding your kid and really having a good sense about how to move forward and help your child move forward, I think lagging skills and unsolved problems are gonna be where the action's at. And once again, I would say that about any diagnosis, not just PDA. Thank you, Dr. Green, for this wonderful information and presentation. This is all the time we have for the session. Once the session is closed, you'll receive a survey on the presentation. We'd greatly appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to, be, to view the recording of the webinar. Additionally, the webinar will be posted on TAA's YouTube channel for those who are unable to participate today. We encourage you to reach out to us about the webinar and other resources and opportunities to connect. On behalf of the Tourette Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. This presentation was presented free of charge thanks to our generous donors. If you appreciated this session, we welcome you to support the organization. May 15th starts Tourette Awareness Month, and we welcome everyone to get out and get active through Miles for Tourette. Visit us at Tourette.org to learn more and to give. Thank you so much, Dr. Green, and have a wonderful day. My pleasure. I hope this has been helpful for people. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're happy to have this as a resource now. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Dr. Green.